What is happening, you guys? Welcome to the Let's Go Win podcast, where we are here to help you be happy, healthy, wealthy, and get better every single day. Today, we're going to be talking about business, and we are going to be talking to somebody that has crushed a couple of businesses, took one from being literally a, a, a brand new business, scaled it all the way to $50 million and exited and he's doing it again, and he's doing it in a major way. Brian Clayton is CEO and co-founder of GreenPal, an online marketplace that connects homeowners with lawn care professionals. GreenPal has been called the Uber for lawn care by Entrepreneur Magazine and has over 200,000 active users completing thousands of transactions every day. What you're going to learn from this episode is running a business, whether it's a lawn uh, care business, whether it's a... Uh, you know, uh, social media business. He talks about so much of the discipline that is required to really scale businesses. He talks about the routines that he does, the self-development that he does. He talks about the entrepreneurial journey, having delayed gratification and not wanting it all right up front. This interview is absolutely going to give you takeaways. It's going to give you inspiration. It's going to help you with your mindset because he literally took his first business that he did as a kid, continued that through high school and college, and took that from a one-person operation to selling it for $50 million, all through hard work, systems, having a routine. He'll say that several times throughout the interview. He talks about that routine. He talks about the fact that it's not just a Monday to Friday, but rather he was so diligent, so intentional about how he was going about uh, his week, how he was making sure to personally develop himself, how finding business partners. There's a section in there, you guys. It is absolute gold where we talk about meeting your, whether it's a co-founder or business partner, some of the, you know, permission to play. How, what are the ways that you might want to go about it? And I thought his answer was amazing. If you're not willing to write this person that $10 million check, don't do it because he knows that business is going to be worth that someday. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And the, really the discipline, that's what I got the most out of it. He was so intentional about making sure the routines are, are sound as he's going through his week, making sure that he is checking in on a frequent basis with his business partners, with his customers. He really has his finger on the pulse to know this is what we need to do with the business. This is where we could get better. And Clearly, he was able to scale these businesses because of it. It's a fascinating interview, and there's so many takeaways. I'm going to go listen again because for somebody to take a lawn care business from literally as a kid making, you know, think of the kid making an extra 20, 50 bucks a, a week to selling it for $50 million, that's remarkable. And yet, the way Brian steps you through the process, it totally makes sense. And you see how he's able to scale these businesses because he is A, extremely clear, B, uh, intentional about everything he does, and C, they, they, they absolutely celebrate all of their wins. You guys are going to love this interview. I'm so glad we were able to bring it to you. And uh, I can't wait to hear your feedback on it. I thought Brian Clayton was an absolute stud. I'm so glad we had him on the show and I hope you got as much out of it as I did. Enjoy the show. Brian, welcome to the show, man. I Uber for lawn care. I This is a new concept for me, brother. Tell me more and I, I we'll get all your history. But when I saw that, I was like, that's pretty cool. Well, thanks for having me on, JM. Yeah, I'm CEO of a company called Green Pal. Green Pal is an app that works like Uber or DoorDash or Postmates. Uh, but for lawn mowing services. So if you need to get a grass cutting service, rather than calling all over the place, you just download GreenPal, you pop your address in and, and you get hooked up with a great lawn mowing service. GreenPal is a 10 year overnight success. My two co-founders and I have been at this for a little over a decade, but now around 300,000 people use it every week for lawn mowing. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because so often from the outside, I think people say, oh, I want that. Like, and they think, oh, this is just instant gratification. But 
anybody that's built a business, and I know you've built a couple of you know pretty large companies, it's not sunshine and rainbows. There's a lot of hard work that you didn't probably see, and it's still hard work, I imagine, today, although you found success. Tell me about that journey, man. You said 10 years in the making. What did that look like? What were some of the the pitfalls you had, some of the things you guys had to overcome? Yeah, it's a really good point. You know, anytime you're looking at a new business idea or you're looking at another person's business, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg as to what goes into bringing that business to life. You know, if you go to a restaurant, you, you, you can only imagine the number of things that have to go right for you to have a satisfactory experience. It would blow our, it would blow our mind. And so that's how it was starting Green Pal. Um, the first thing that caught me off guard was I was inventing a new product from scratch that did not exist. Nobody knew how to use it. Nobody knew to use it. Nobody knew it existed. Uh, we didn't know what it needed to look like, how, how we needed to build it. So there, and there was no playbook for this. Nobody had ever tried this before. And so we just had to go from like one failure to the next uh, and learn from each failure and, and not lose our enthusiasm. And it just took a while. It took three or four years to, to get a product that worked w correctly, worked right. Um, I remember <laughs> it was year two and we were still in Nashville, Tennessee. Now we're in every city in the United States, but we were just, just in Nashville. And, uh, and we were thinking, man, we really, I want to launch our second market, but I just don't feel like it's time yet. And my co-founder said, bro, if if a hundred people use this thing last week, we piss off seventy eight of them. <laughs> we we don't need to launch a second market, and so and so we kept working on that like uh, happy customer versus pissed off customer until we got it to like ninety eight people out of a hundred were happy, and that took about three years and just slowly fixing every single problem that we came across until we had something that was scalable. Yeah, it is fascinating because obviously we all want growth and, and you hear you said the word scalable growth is a good thing, but not always growth is great growth because you're not prepared. The you know, you don't have the infrastructure in place, whatever it might be. And that is one of those interesting things, because as entrepreneurs, we're driven. We want to we want to grow this thing as fast as humanly possible. But what great insight for your your co-founder to say, Let's pump the brakes for a minute so that we can actually have real growth that that it and satisfied customers. So we have a great product. Now they're cu customers. Now it's going to allow for really exponential growth. And it sounds like that's kind of what happened with you guys. Yeah. And and um, this sounds obvious, but <laughs> it's it's really hard to, to go slow and low for a while. It's really hard to nail it, then scale it. And you see this in, in venture capital. The, there was uh, an avalanche of money that got funded, uh, that got thrown at Uber for X ideas. So Uber for home cleaning, Uber for laundry service, Uber for valet parking, Uber for car washing, uh, a lot of other Uber for lawn care ideas also. And pretty much mm, all of them failed. Uh, there's only a handful that are still around now five or, or six years later. And the one cardinal sin that I think all of them uh, made was they were trying to to grow too quickly. They were trying to uh, put rocket fuel in the Toyota Camry, and 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 what do you think is going to happen? It's just going to blow apart. And until you have that customer experience dialed in, um, that you're making 99 out of 100 people happy in a row, um, there's no reason to scale it because you're just going to be pouring gasoline on wet leaves, and it's not going to go anywhere. And then you then you've wasted all your investor capital and. Now your cap table is all messed up and, and, and you don't want to keep going. You're, you're out of energy because there's no, no reason to keep pushing forward. So that's a, that's a cautionary tale that I think every founder who's considering raising money uh, needs to understand that be, you know, don't raise money until you're ready for the rocket fuel. You mentioned the failures and not losing enthusiasm. One of my favorite quotes is literally continuing on to progress while not losing enthusiasm for what you're doing what was it your guys' mindset when it was like, not maybe failures, or maybe they were, I don't know, but where it wasn't hitting as great as you wanted, or there were setbacks. What was the mindset when you guys got in a room to say, we know we have this, but gosh, that sucks. I mean, we just got our butts kicked. Yeah. How did you continue with that path with enthusiasm? Because often I think this is where, like the book, Three Feet from Gold, this is where people literally stop because oh, I got that setback. You know what? I'm just going to go back. I'm going to go back to what I know. 
clearly you guys were able to overcome that. What was the mindset like in those rooms? Yeah, it was it, it was not easy, and, and it wasn't all positive, and it wasn't like we were just excited every step of the way because it was challenging when things aren't working like you want them to. Uh, it's in challenge. It's challenging to keep your enthusiasm, uh, you know, for for the mission. The the way I I I experienced it, and the, and the way we kind of got through that was we really rewired our brains a little bit in terms of setting little small goals and then uh, then celebrating them like they were huge victories. And so so the first thing we did was uh, we didn't really have any customers. Um, and we might have had 10 people try the first version of the app and all of them were were displeased by the experience. And, but so we would meet with them and they would tell us all the ways that uh, our app sucked and and they would tell us everything that was wrong with it. The long guy didn't show up. The long guy did a bad job. The long guy didn't honor, honor his price. Uh, the long guy would tell us everywhere we suck. Uh, it was too far away from me. The grass was five feet tall. Uh, customer was was uh, was insatiable. All of these things. And so. And so we would like take notes on all of these things that we needed to fix and improve. And then we would also, but then it hit me one day, everybody's telling us everywhere that we let them down, but nobody said, I don't need this. Nobody said, uh, why are you building this? Nobody said, like they were let down that it did not work like they expected it to. And then so I thought, well, what if it did, you know, like people would use this. And so that was how we got kind of through level one of the game. And then, and then we set a really small goal, which ended up taking two years to achieve, of we just need to get 100 people to use it in a week. From Monday through the end of Sunday, we need 100 transactions from 100 individual people. And I thought that would take two months. It ended up taking two years. But we just kept writing the number on the board every Sunday. Okay, we got, we got 47 this week. Oh, we went down. Why did we go down? Uh, you know, okay, now we're at 75. We're almost there. It took another year. And uh, but when we got to that hundred, we celebrated it like it was a million, because I knew if we got to a hundred, I know I can get to a thousand. And if I know if I get to a thousand, I can get to ten, and then a hundred thousand and beyond. Now we're at three hundred thousand people. I know I can get to a million. It's just a matter of time and compounding. And so every little goal we celebrated like it was a big goal because because then you could just like extrapolate out. Okay, well I know compounding. It's going to take some time, but I know compounding will work. It'll do its thing. Yeah, celebrating the the these small wins, guys. Which again, getting to a hundred is not small because, as as Brian just said, if I can get to a hundred, I know I can I can double that. I can get to a thousand because if I've done it once, now I can do it again. Um, this is one of the big things that I think people forget to do is celebrate. Yes, we haven't reached our goal, which uh, even at two hundred thousand active users, I'm guessing you're looking even further past that. Is so this is a a mark. And I'm sure you celebrated the hell out of it. But you know what? There's a bigger one. But we aren't going to look back and say we're not there yet and, and come down on ourselves. But rather, let's celebrate the fact that we have grown this much. That is truly, there, there's some real gains there. And that is such a key to building momentum. Uh, brother, I got to ask you, why lawn care? Why, why was that a passion for years? You just saw a major need where you're like, gosh. My lawn guy sucks. I, I need to help someone. Yeah, it was it was really, really, really simple for me. My first business was a grass cutting business. I started mowing lawns in high school as a way to make extra cash. Stuck with that lawn mowing business all through high school, all through college. And then when I graduated uh, college, I went to business school and I made I made a little business plan. I thought I'm going to stick with this lawn care company, see how far I can take it. And, and I ended up building it into a, a real business. Eventually, around 150 employees. Um, it got, it got to eight figures a year in revenue. One of the larger landscaping businesses in the state of Tennessee where I live. And then in 2013, it caught the interest of a big national company in that industry and they bought it. They bought the company. And, and so I sold the business, took it like, a, like six months off and got really bored. It got to get existential really quick. And I thought I need another project. I need another mission. Another reason that I, it's important for me to, to learn and grow and get out of bed in the morning. And so I thought, well, somebody is going to build a, a platform that makes this whole industry run smoother. I know the industry very well. I don't know the first thing about technology. I don't, I've never built a website, but, but I, I at least know the industry. So I was kind of solving my own problem. I, I knew somebody was going to build it. I felt like I, I knew enough about the industry where I could build it right the first time. And then I could learn the tech. And, and I thought, well, you know, it'll take a year, maybe two. We'll be off and going. And that took five. 
but at least I had the problem and the solution right, and then everything else I could figure out. And I think authenticity c- can be a competitive advantage when you're trying to bring a new product to the marketplace, uh, because that was like the only good idea I had. I knew this industry, I knew technology could solve problems, and I just spent a decade on it. You talk about peak performance mindset. Uh, it's one of the topics that I that uh, is on here. And again, when I think of it, when I think of lawn care, I don't think, yep, peak performance. However, it's a business. And the truth is you took something that you did as a kid, followed through all through college and scaled to eight figures, I think you said, which that's remarkable. I Again, I think of all my buddies that did that. I mean, where they literally had, you know, making some extra cash, but you built it into an eight figure business. Now it's even growing, I, I'm guessing even further than that. What about the peak performance mindset? Where have you picked this up? Is it self development? Is this something you learned in college? Is this from your parents? What? What? Where did you figure that part out? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I picked this up in the first business, and then and then doubled down on it in the second. So, in the first company, I really kind of had a chip on my shoulder that that uh, that I really wanted to build something big, and and I wanted to build something successful. And 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 to me, grass and landscaping didn't matter. That was kind of like the vehicle to build something that, that I could grow to, to $10 million a year in revenue and hundreds of employees. And so, so that, and, and then I started realizing you don't have the skills to get there. You have reached, uh, you know, talk, looking at myself in the mirror, you have reached the point of your skills and that is what is causing the company to, to plateau. And I think as a founder, you're doing three things at once at all times. You're working in the business, making sure it's running smoothly. You're working on the business. What are the systems processes? What are the routines? What are the standard operating procedures? And then the third thing is, is you're working on yourself. You have to level up. You got to learn stuff like leadership, management, marketing, accounting, strategy, bookkeeping, all these things. And you got to like take time to listen to podcasts, go to YouTube University, go to conferences, read books, all these things. You have to set aside time to level up. And, and this was not something that I, I was observing with people I went to school with or people I hung out with. Uh, I, I was only observing it from the truly successful uh, entrepreneurs that, that, that I had the, the privilege of working around. So, so um, you know, my first business was a landscaping company. I worked with a lot of successful real estate developers. And, and I started under, lo, lo, watching them and, and understanding like these people are operating at another level they think way differently. They're not any smarter than me. Like they're not like you know how you meet somebody like their oven just burns hotter than yours. Like they're just a, they're just a brilliant person. These people were, were, were very ordinary as far as that was concerned. But but they did stuff like 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 attended conferences and 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 took time to read books and and uh, and and took time to work on themselves. They were just operating at a higher level. And so I was able to observe that uh, at, at a young age and apply it to myself, hold myself accountable that that once a week for four or five hours, I'm going to work on myself and I'm going to and it's block and tackling for whatever it is. My business is plateauing at the time, you know, like when I was building Green Pal, I I learned really early on that copywriting was important, that that words on a screen really matter. So I read every single book I could get my hands on around copywriting. It took a year. But I came. I became a pretty decent copywriter, and then and then had to do that for engineering, and had to do that for design, and all these things. And so, I think it's important to to understand that, like, if you want to create a breakthrough, if you want to create a successful business, you're gonna have to be a little weird, and and you're gonna have to operate at a level that nobody else around you is is, is naturally operating at for a while until you can surround yourself with people that are like you. He mentioned four to five hours in a week, guys. I want everybody to hear that for a moment because often I ask this question to almost everybody. How much time are you dedicating to yourself to really developing, to getting better? How much self-care are you giving yourself? And you had a very clear answer, four to five hours that I'm going to make sure and give it. Was that in one like close the door, this is deep work? Would you do it one hour a day? What does that look like for you, Brian? For me, it's real simple. I I try to break it up by days. And so Monday through Friday is in the business. It's okay. Our employees are getting done what they need to get be getting done. Are we hitting the numbers like we're supposed to? Are our customers happy? What what are customers saying? Is stuff getting shipped? Is stuff getting built in the business? Saturday 
is on the business. It's, it's three, four, maybe five hours on the business. What is what does our SEO strategy look like? What does our content marketing strategy look like? Where where is traffic coming from? What 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 does the competitive landscape look like? Just picking one of those things, spending three, four, five hours on it, and then Sunday afternoon, every week is my routine where I sit down and I and I read. Uh, I try to knock out a book that I'm that I'm working on. I try to read at least one or two books a month, or I'm watching some conference on YouTube that. I'm not like necessarily interested in, but I know I should watch the keynotes and I should watch the fireside chats or something like that. Or I'm pouring over some kind of blog that, that relates to whatever it is we're, we're working on in the business. So three, four, five hours every Sunday afternoon is, is how I, how I've managed to kind of like segment it out. And I've done that the last 10 years. And if you do that regularly after about two years, you'll notice you become a totally different person. And then it begins to build on itself and then compounding takes its place. And, and before you know it, you know, you might run into an old friend that you hadn't seen in 15 years and you're like, I can't hang out with this person anymore. They're on a different planet than me. How the hell did I ever hang out with them in the first place? And that sounds terrible, but, but it's true and it will happen. Uh, I mean, look, people develop, grow at, at different rates and that's, that's cool. It's just, it is it, when you're truly pouring into yourself, that's a part of it. You, you mentioned bringing on, uh, or I don't know if it's bringing on, but you uh, co-founder. And partnerships can be really an interesting animal, especially if you're, you've been a solopreneur or you just really have done it yourself. How has that gone for you? I don't know in the first business if you had partners as well or if you just really did it yourself. But when it comes to partnerships, how do you really vet that person out to make sure that you guys are really aligned with one another and that this is a good fit? Because often you hear of those horror stories about partnerships and we weren't, we weren't compatible and it wasn't the right fit. It seems like you've kind of figured that one out. Yeah. It, it I don't know of any silver bullet for this other than a couple of things that, that uh, 22 years, both businesses had partnerships and it wasn't all up and to the right. There were some rocky moments in the first company and, and in the second company. But I, I, I think I look at it this way. So I got very lucky and, and, and luck is and hope is not a strategy when it comes to, to getting a co-founder. So my advice based on my experience is this, go it alone as long as you can and and try to meet your business soulmate. And what I mean by that is try to meet the person you couldn't imagine starting the business without, and you couldn't imagine being successful without them, and that their skills complement yours, and between the two of you, one plus one is three. It really is kind of like a marriage almost. It's kind of funny. People will will date somebody for two or three years, get engaged for a year, and then get married. And that's, that's, that's important. That's an important decision. But then they'll, they'll found a business with somebody they've known a month. And, and the reality is, is that you're going to spend more time with, with this business partner than you are your actual spouse. And if the business is successful or unsuccessful, it's more work to actually unwind a business partnership than it is to just, to just get a divorce. And so it's, it's very strange how people kind of jump into a business partnership so quickly without thinking this, this, this stuff through. So find your business soulmate and a couple litmus tests that, that I'll, that I like to think about is um, if you had if you had ten million dollars in the bank, would you write a check for all ten million dollars and that, that'll take you to zero to this co-founder for them to start the business with you? And and if you're not willing to do that, then don't. And here's why: ultimately, their their equity is going to be worth ten million dollars or more at some point. Um, you may want to go raise money. You may want to raise funding. And the amount of dilution you're taking on is going to be five, 10, 20 million dollars. And if you didn't have a co-founder, it would increase your, your optionality. So just, just run through that mental exercise day one. If I had 10 million dollars, is this a 10 million dollar co-founder? Are they worth 10 million dollars today? And if they're not, don't start the business I'll, uh, with them. A lot of times people rush to get a co-founder as a coping mechanism thinking, okay, if I can find somebody who's just as crazy as me, who wants to like leave their job and like go all in on this idea, then I'll do it. And that's not the right way to look at it. It should be, okay, I know this domain. I know X, Y, and Z. I need somebody who has these skills and who knows this thing. And then the two of us come together and it's Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. That's what you're looking for. And don't do it unless you find it. 
this is really important. I hope everybody heard it because, uh, again, you're right. People do jump into business because, you know what? They have skills that I don't. Therefore, this is going to work. That's not the way it works, it, and unfortunately. And you've talked a lot on this, well, you know, on the show that you've developed skills through the years. So, yes, there might be complementary goal or, uh, you know, skill sets for one another. But if we're not aligned value wise, if, and my litmus test is if you, if you can sleep next to my wife and I fully trust you, that's my, there you go. I like that. That's good. And one. it's like, look, man, if, if I even stop for a second, I go, yeah. eh, nope. And I yeah. don't care if it's a male or female guys. So we're clear. It's just that test. Do I trust you? Yeah. Big Skills one. can be developed. Yep. So true. What a, that is a good test. Add that to the list. Because you're going to be in the foxhole with this person. You're going to go through hell with them. You got to be able to trust them and, uh, and, and also trust that they will be giving it their all just like you, you are. You know, something you need to look for is like the past behavior is, is the best predictor of the future. Is this person, even though they might have these skills, is this person just naturally curious? Do they have a side project? Do they have a blog they're running? Do they have a podcast that they're running? Is when you Google them, do you find anything? Uh, like, is there like a footprint there of things they have done? <laughs> like, look for evidence of things they have done because that's going to be the pr best predictor of what they're going to do with you in the trenches. Yeah, my wife is really good at this. She she Facebook stalks. I'll, I'll just say it. Anybody <laughs> that know, like she figures things out about people utilizing social media and. You know, I'd have why uh, have dinner with their significant other. Really get to know these human beings before you sign that paper. Because as Brian said, right. it is way more difficult than a divorce. Yeah. Look, sixty percent of marriages are in uh, end in divorce. Partnerships, I don't think are that high. I, I don't. I hope not because I I've been through it. Oh well, well, businesses that fail. You know, I don't know. Like, I think I. You know, if you're trying to sort of. A tech startup, ninety percent of those just fail anyways, and and so the, if you add the the, the dynamic of a co-founder in there, it, the odds are stacked against you. Um, you know, the best decision you're going to make is is the co-founder that you decide that you choose, or or not, or 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 going it alone. You'd be amazed as to how far you can take it alone, and and just take it as far as you can alone, then attract the best co-founder. It'd be like trying to go. Uh, you know, a tr uh, get, get in the dating dating scene, and and you're 100 pounds overweight. Well, are you are you going into this business that way? Mm. Do do you do you do you not have any skills? Do you have credit card debt? You know, have you are you working on this thing nights and weekends? Have you taken it as far as you can? Because if you haven't done any of those things, you're not going to attract a very good co-founder. Yeah, you definitely want to come from a, a source of strength and not yeah. weakness. Anytime you're negotiating, and yeah. often, unfortunately, whether it's due to the economy or due to, I see people start to give up on that dream, start to negotiate from a place of weakness. And that's when ultimately some bad deals can take place. Uh, I want to talk about crucial conversations because you mentioned in both businesses, there's tough times. And often I think the ability to sit down with one another, and this could be, we can talk about business partnerships. We can talk about marriages. It's kind of the same idea. Having that ability to look at the other person and say, look, we need to have a real serious conversation. We need to talk about what's really going on. How does that look like? Do you guys have a process for that? Is it something where we close the door and we just know, hey, we're going to, we need to hammer this out? Is it grab the, the bourbon bottle and put out a couple glasses and let's get it hammered out? What does that look like for you guys? Because every business has a slightly different process, but I think really understanding you're going to have crucial conversations. It's not always going to be smooth and that's okay. How can you communicate with one another? Yeah. Especially with co-founders in the early days when it's just the two of you in a room, those conversations can make or break the business. And there's been times where I've had blind spots. There's been times when my co-founders had blind spots and we had to work through that stuff. And every single time, I'm regretting, not regretting. I'm, 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 I'm like not looking forward to that conversation. That is an indication that I'm in the right place. That I need to have that conversation. And it's, and it's always the stuff that you wait too long on and that you, that you, that you kick down the, you kick the can down the road. And then 
when you when you finally deal with it, it, it the, the the debt comes due with interest because you didn't deal with it a month ago or a year ago, and now it's it's compounded and it, and and it can get to a point where it's untenable. So the way we deal with this is it, we have a weekly meeting with just the two co-founders and, and I. And we talk about everything that's going on uh, with the business, everything that we're working on. And then we just say, listen, is there anything I'm not seeing? What, if, what, what, if, what, if, what, do you see anything different than, than, than I do? I don't, and this is, this is something that I got from uh, reading uh, one of Ray Dalio's books. I don't care if, if what, the, what the answer is. I don't care if I'm right or wrong. I just want the business to be correct. And so, so what, I don't care if it's my idea or your idea, but what is the correct answer for the business? And then the, the thing we try to do is we try to let as much data speak as possible. Like whenever we're, we're, we're d disagreeing about something, we try to go back to, okay, well, let's pop open the analytics. Let's pop open the, the data. Let's, let's do some SQL queries and figure out what the data is saying. And then, you know, I'm proven wrong or my co-founder is proven wrong. So it's, it's, it's less about uh, what we do and it's more about the routine. It's every Monday at 10 o'clock we meet and we talk through these things. And then you don't have to deal with this stuff with, with a bunch of interest that's accumulated. And, and like, because it, it, I, I did it wrong in the first business and, and I had to come to the conclusion that, you know, I built this environment. This is all my fault. You don't want to get to a point where, where you're driving to the office and you don't want to go there. Let that scare you. And so hold yourself accountable to deal with this stuff on a weekly basis. Yeah, he mentioned Ray Dalio, guys, and one of my favorite business books is Principles. I yeah. know it's a long one, but I will tell you, radical transparency. It's a, it's a really challenging idea for some business owners. It is life-altering for others, and that would be the case for me. And that ability to receive feedback, clearly you guys excel on feedback. I mean, you've mentioned that many times. What are the customers saying? What are the, you know the vendors saying? And you are taking that in. How how do you collect your feedback, brother? Is it a constant survey being sent out? Is it just an open form? What does that look like for your business? Really, really good question. So there's a mantra that I, I stole from somebody. I can't remember who, but listen to your customers or you will have none. And that is that like struck paranoia in me, and especially in the early days when we had 5, 10, 20 people using the thing. I would... <laughs> At a necessity, I would reach out to them and, hey, can I take you to coffee at Starbucks or, or can I run by your house real quick and, and, and watch you use the app, you know, at your kitchen table and you can tell me everything you wish it would do that it didn't. We needed that feedback to survive. It was R&D for us to understand this is what we need to focus our, our little bit of firepower that we have. We need to focus it on, on these two or three things. And as you get that feedback, especially in the early days, you can, you can triage it to the to the one, two, or three things you need to focus on. Yeah, there's a hundred things wrong with the business, but let's just focus on these one or two or three things because these are the things that we keep hearing from our customers. And so in the early days, it's very much hand cranking. I know the inside of every Starbucks in, in, uh, in Nashville, Atlanta, and Tampa because those were, those were our first three cities. <laughs> Kitchen tables, belly to belly with your customer. Then once you get to like maybe 100, 200 customers, then you got you got you got to scale this a little bit, and uh, and I think up to a thousand customers, the, the 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 email needs to go to to you, the founder, the the company email, the company like auto emails respond back to you. Uh, the company phone number is your cell number because you need that feedback. You need to make yourself widely available to your to your first hundred or five hundred customers, and and uh, and you know it's not like. It's not happening to you. It's happening for you. That's free R and D that you that you're getting to understand what it is you need to be focused on. I mean, it, I ne I haven't been at a loss for what we needed to focus our efforts on in the last ten years because we're always getting that river of customer feedback. And so now today we have we have a few hundred thousand people using the app. I still do at least one hour a day. I try to do at least two hours a day of of customer. Uh, customer support myself. So I'm answering like the main 1-800 phone number. I'm doing in-app chat. I'm working through email tickets. So then I can say, okay, th th this is what I'm hearing from customers. These are the two or three things that people are upset about. And, and it helps me like clarify my decision making. And then the other thing it does is when I'm going to a meeting with our head of SEO or my CTO or my, my, my CMO, I can sit, I can sit there and talk from a, from a place of a, of, of, of uh, 
of knowledge and authority and say, listen, no, actually, I was in a com I had three conversations with three real customers last week. They're saying this. It's not that. Let's look at the data and 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 validate that. And and so it really is just something so simple that that you can do in the early days and, and on way on into year 10 in the business to keep yourself on the right track. Yeah, guys, one piece of advice. Whenever you receive feedback, try your very, very best not to get defensive and always just say thank you. Yeah. Because like Brian said, they are doing this for you. They're not, this isn't a personal attack. It's, they are giving you gold. Accept it that way. And then you notice that he always takes it back to, these are the facts. It's not an emotional decision at this point. This is what the data is telling us. And that allows these conversations to take place. Uh, you exited the, the first business. Uh, I think you said 50 million, uh, from that first business. What did that look like for you? At what point were you like, yes, I know I want to sell? Because again, this is a, almost like a child. This is a something you've created. This is your baby. And there came a time where you said, okay. Man, I got it, such an offer. It's it's one of those Godfather moments. Like it's, it's one I I I I can't refuse. Or was it? You know what? I built this business and I saw it to to fruition as long as I wanted to take it. Let's let somebody else grab it and run. What did that look like for you, Brian? Yeah, for me, it was very much a uh, an intentional process that that we ran. And from the moment I had the idea that I wanted to explore and exit to the day that we finally got it sold was little over two years. So it took a long time to get the business in a position where it could be acquired. I wish somebody had beat me over the head with a, with a stick and, and said, Hey, you want, you're going to, you want to sell the business five years from now, you better start working on this exit plan. There's a great book about this called built to sell where you can, you can proactively run a plan to sell a business and you need to, if you have any dreams of doing that. If you're not ever going to sell it, then then don't worry about it. But if you ever think about you, you might want to. The, the way you run a business as a lifestyle business versus one that eventually will be acquired are very, very different. One is from the heart and the other one is from the spreadsheet. And if you ever want to sell your business, you're going to have to run it from the spreadsheet and nothing else uh, because that's going to dictate whether it's it's viable or it to sell and what your ultimate outcome will be. And for me, the the reason why I decided to to explore getting it acquired was I started noticing about year thirteen or fourteen that that I was plateauing as as a as a as a founder as an entrepreneur. I was no longer getting uh, the challenges from the business that caused me to level up, and it was kind of like I didn't want to go take a class on leadership, and I didn't want to go take a class on statistical analysis and I didn't want to learn how to code software and all these things. But, but like I was discontent because I wasn't doing that. It's, it, it's a weird thing. It's like, I don't want to do this. It's kind of like working out. Like you don't want to get up and go work out, but after the workout's done, you're glad you did it. Well, business is a lot like that. And, and so the business ha ha was doing well, but like it was no longer requiring me to level up. And so I was just like not happy. And I thought, well, you know, I need to create space for the next thing to happen. And so the, the first thing I need to do is sell this company. And, and that's why I sold it. And, and I ended up getting exactly what I wanted. I started this second business and it was 10 times harder than I ever thought it would be. But, but two years later, I was a different person. And every two years, I'm evolving into a whole new person because of what the business is requiring from me. I'm always ahead of my skis. I'm totally unqualified to be running the business at whatever scale it is. So I'm having to backfill that and learn and grow and, and get better at as, a, as a founder. Yeah, it is interesting when you almost perfect something. And I'm not saying the company is perfect, but it was running smoothly. We get bored at yeah. times. And so, and look, human beings like to be challenged. And clearly, that's what you sought out and you found it. I want to ask about goals because you have, it seems like, a real process to, again, the analytics seem to be a big thing for you, which is awesome because it gives you proper metrics. You know where you stand. But often people have this, this dream, this vision, this goal. But I don't know if they know how to really schedule one out to where, hey, this is a realistic goal for, like you said, to get to 100 customers. We thought that was going to be a, a, a one month, a one year goal, and it ended up being two years. However, it was still the right goal. What does that process look for you, like for you guys? How do you determine what that is and how are you doing that? Because you're at 200,000. What, what's that next goal look like? Yeah, I try to forecast 12 months out 
This is where we want to be in 12 months. And then that's the goal. And then I almost don't even worry about that goal. I almost forget about it. And then I just, then I just focus all of my time on, okay, what are the habits and the routines and the, and, and the things we're doing in the business every day? And let's just focus all of our attention on that. So it's like the output metric is the goal. It's, if it's 500K customers or a million customers, that's the goal. That's the output. But what are the inputs? Let's just focus on the inputs. Okay, so what does that actually mean? Okay, wh- that means that we're writing this amount of content per day. It means that we're shipping th- these many features per month. It means that this roadmap of things that people want us to, to, to improve about the product, all of that gets done. And that means we got to get this done by this week. And, and so what does the inputs look like? And, and, and just worry about those uh, routines around making sure that stays on track. Okay. I'm, I'm meeting with my CTO once a week. I'm meeting with my, my, my CMO once a week. I've got a, I've got a head of growth that works side by side with me and we're checking in every day. And so uh, maybe every day is not enough. Maybe twice a day is what we need to be doing. And so really tuning those inputs and, and holding myself accountable to the routines of the business and, and then, and then, and then letting the goal happen. Sometimes we don't hit it. And then we try to figure, okay, well, where did we come up short? You know, what was wrong with the routines? What was wrong with the habits with the, of the business? It's not like, oh, we didn't hit the goal. We'll try again next year. It's like, no, let's diagnose what we screwed up, and then let's take another crack at it. Guys, discipline equals freedom. You've heard me say it before, but if you've listened to Brian throughout, he talked about doing the additional work on, on Saturday, doing that planning and some of that growth on Sundays. He clearly has this down to where discipline equals freedom and it's allowed him to build these scale these scalable businesses which is amazing brian what didn't i know enough to ask you that you want to make sure to share with the audience as we start to wrap this up yeah you know i think uh i i i I think some people listening to this might be thinking yeah you know i would I'd, i'd like to I'd like to do that. I would like to start my own tech company. I would like to, I would like to be in business for myself. And maybe you're not. And, uh, and, and, and maybe you're thinking about it. And then you think, well, I'm too late. You know, I missed it. Um, you know, SAS has already taken over the world or, or maybe you want to start a construction company and, and you're like, oh, there's already five or 10 construction businesses in my town. Or maybe you want to, you know, maybe you want to start a restaurant. It doesn't matter what it is. And you think, oh, I'm too late. I missed it. And the reality is you didn't miss it. Uh, our, you know, our economy goes through ups and downs, but it, but over the course of 10 or 20 years, it's up and to the right. And it always gets bigger. Like technology is always going to get bigger. Software is always going to get bigger. Um, you're, you, 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 the, the local market for a need for construction services or whatever is always going to get bigger. And so you didn't miss it. Get started today. Get in the game because only when you're in the game, do you, do, can you win? Can you, can you, can you prosper? And, and I think that gets missed out a lot. It's not too late. You didn't miss it. Yeah, the, no doubt about it. The economy continues to grow. AI, I didn't even ask you about, but I mean, my God, the, it's just allowing us to do some Huge incredible unlock. stuff. Huge unlock. Yeah, and I know I said it was kind of the last one, but what? how are you guys implementing using AI? Is that something on a daily basis you guys are using frequently? Yes, and, and it's not a replacement for anybody or anything. It just makes everybody into a super super whatever they were. So if you're an engineer, and now it now makes you like a top 1% engineer. If you're a content creator, you can now create five or 10 times the content. If you're a designer, you don't have to waste time moving pixels around. Now you can pu- you can create five times more content that was better than uh, or designs that it was better than you were making so so it, it allows you to do so much more with so much less that it, i think it's going to help democratize entrepreneurship and make it even more accessible for people who are willing to learn how to leverage it it's, it, it really is a fulcrum for anybody wanting to start a business yeah there's a whole thing right now i tell you the gpts that are now operating as basically an additional employee it's not just you putting in prompts anymore and i know it's not just chat gpt there's so many ai tools out there but these gpts are incredible what they can build uh brian it's i love all the the advice you've had brother i love the the fact that you so practical the advice is very simple and yet very profound uh, thanks for coming on, man. This, this is awesome. If people wanted to know more about GreenPal, connect with you online, what's the best place to to reach you? Well, thanks for having me on, Jam. I really appreciate it. Uh, any anybody want to hit me up? LinkedIn, uh, Instagram's a great place to reach me. Brian M. Clayton. 
Um, and then anybody want to check out Green Pal, just go to greenpal.com or download it in the App Store or Play Store. Guys, everyone, not everyone, the, a lot of people need lawn care. I, I know my wife was actually just talking about this. So this is going to be funny. I'm going to go to her and say, hey, go check this out because I wasn't familiar with it. Let's see if this is a service that we can utilize. Awesome. Yeah, man, for sure. And finding that person that has the background, that has the referrals, all the legwork's been done. Brian's team took care of it. Uh, brother, thanks for coming on, man. You're awesome. Thanks, JM. You guys go check it out. Make sure and go use Green Pal. I mean, if you have a lawn and you're not in love with your landscape company right now, give it a shot. Until next time, remember your mindset matters. I appreciate y'all. We'll talk soon. <laughs>